the first article is regarding that whether supreme court should uh, have proceedings that can be live streamed okay so the first argument is saying that yes it should be done because it makes the legal system to deliver on its promise of empowering the masses and it's saying that indian legal system is built on the concept of open courts which means that uh, whatever the proceedings are they will be open to all members of public but the reality is different because we can see that in the court room only a handful of people are physically present and are allowed in the court room because many a times because of security concerns i mean not every person is allowed in the court room okay so why i mean the thing is that okay we are having you know so much technology uh, technological advancement in every field we are talking about artificial intelligence in fact fine so why shouldn't the legal system benefit from technology fine so because on one hand when courts are they themselves are adopting digitization for example online records of all cases fine then you can file fir online then automated system of case rotation so obviously this can also be done okay so why shouldn't millions of people they should be allowed to watch the rich deliberations that take place in the court room fine because it said that justice should not only be done but it should also be seen okay and this is the cardinal principle of justice delivery that you don't just have to you know uh, do the justice you have to present your case in a way find that the people should be able to see that yes justice is being done because only then people will have trust on the institution known as judiciary and on the rule of law fine so to maintain the credibility and this legitimacy of government and its institutions it should it should be there that people should be able to see that yes justice have been done okay and this is the basic basically principle that underlines the whole idea of petition which is filed by senior advocate indra jaising okay but in, okay uh, we we are saying that uh, i mean uh, uh, technological advancement should also take place within the judicial domains as well but yes there needs to be certain exceptions because not all cases they can be live streamed okay and not in all courts because in matters which have a privacy dimension just such as family matters or criminal matters or matters which are legal uh, procedural intricacies fine or such as trial court matters which are out of scope but so these matters because these have certain privacy dimensions you cannot live stream them but the matters which have a bearing on the public at large fine i mean the matters which have public importance such as entry of women to the sabari mala temple or the scope of the right to the choice of one's food fine or the constitutionality of aadhaar scheme fine because i mean no one's privacy is involved in this fine although the matter is obviously entirely about privacy but the accused ones or whosoever is basically you know they are just uh, taking this uh, case in the court it's not about their privacy or about the legality of section 377 of ipc so these you know because these matters are of public importance so they can be live streamed fine and the first thing is this and second thing is that to promote transparency live streaming has been allowed for both rajya sabha and lok sabha proceedings since 2004 fine so when on one hand we are having a live streaming for one institution of government and that is legislature uh, executive is also in built in it fine the entire council of ministers they are our executive so we are having basically um, live streaming of two uh, i mean this uh, pillars of government then why not the third institution that is the judiciary fine why not it can have live streaming and in fact if we see international examples then the courts the highest courts in canada and in australia they also uh, live stream their cases fine okay apart from that what 
uh, they're saying that see the right to information rti access to justice and uh, all these things along with the need to educate common people on how the judiciary functions they are strong reasons in favor of allowing live stream of court proceedings fine and i mean because you know these days we are seeing that judiciary has given a particular judgment fine but the media then the fake news faulty reporting they basically you know misinterpret if i have to give you example the uh, judgment on the national anthem case judiciary said that national anthem should be played but it never said that it should be compulsory and those who are not standing when national anthem is being played on the screen then they should be punished fine but people media they misinterpreted it fine so so as to avoid this you know fake news then the misinterpretations and faulty reporting uh, so obviously the need is to live stream whatever the judicial judgments are okay and now uh, the writer is saying that those people those section which are basically objecting this that there may be technical glitches fine so the thing is that we can you know uh, very easily resolve these issues fine and uh, court will be reduced to a spectacle fine so it's not the case okay it's just mere criticism just for the sake of criticism okay and if you say that there will be a lot of information uh, uh, on the i mean uh, to be live uh, streamed then don't talk about information in the age of big data fine we have already covered articles on that a lot big data is all about collecting information and data mining so they're saying that in a democracy collection of information please don't talk about it it's it's normal in a democracy fine and so the thing is that this petition fine presents the hope of new india where technology promises to be the game changer if those in power understand its importance and use its right so obviously the indian legal system should adopt this so that the masses can be empowered and they should not be scared of the government institutions and on these basis i mean uh, the use of technology then it's basically within the domain of right to information fine uh, except the these uh, privacy matters which involve certain sorts of private issues so these can be live streamed this is one of the opinion now this next uh, view is that that no i mean it uh, the whatever the uh, proceedings in are the supreme court proceedings are they should not be live stream because see uh, the core uh, 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 i mean um, reason is that it is uh, neither accountable to the general public nor to the sovereign see it's saying that the role of judiciary cannot be equated with the roles of the legislature and the executive that with which we in the previous argument we said that since 2004 we are having i mean rajya sabha and lok sabha are having uh, uh, proceedings live streamed okay so he's saying that we cannot equate the role of judiciary with legislature and executive because see uh, public cannot judge the judges judges are accountable neither to the general public nor to the sovereign okay they are accountable only to the rule of law and to the constitution as established by law fine for judges constitution is so uh, supreme okay and apart from that so the first reason is that i mean these uh, uh, judges they are not accountable to the public now the second reason is that suppose uh, the court proceedings are going on and the judges or the bench in the supreme court it knows that whatever we are saying it's basically you know live streaming people are listening to it so don't you think that the judges will get conscious about whatever they are saying fine because thousands and lakhs millions of people are watching them fine so i mean the, there is a, a good intentions behind live streaming of this uh, supreme court proceedings but the unwanted public gaze caused by live streaming will tend to make judges subject to popular public opinion so suppose if i mean judges uh, they are giving uh, i mean judgment on a particular issue and they know that people they are watching them live fine so i mean although i'm not saying that the judges 
they are you know uh, not objective but you know a kind of impression that may come into mind that they should adhere their judgment to the popular public i mean the popular will what the people basically are wanting fine it may be the case however if <coughs> life st- <coughs> sorry however uh, if the live streaming is, was uh, would not have been there then their judgment would have been different fine so or the arguments uh, before uh, regarding their judgment would have been different okay so this is also a very important issue fine while the interest to act for the executive and legislature lies in pop- popularity see executive and legislature they needs popularity because they have to contest the elections fine so they 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 seek votes so that's why they kind of you know uh, uh, tend to uh, gives uh, we have seen in rajya sabha and lok sabha right the mps and uh, ministers they try to give speeches and raise public questions because they know that they are basically being live streamed and people are watching them fine and media and all these uh, 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 houses they are going to raise these questions and they are going to say that oh this mp has raised this question he is so much concerned about people or this government is so much concerned about people so definitely legislature and executive they need you know popularity but the courts they have to carry out justice even if it involves one person against everyone else fine the individuality of judges is more likely to become a subject of public debate through live streaming this is also a matter of concern that if a judge who is uh, giving any judgment not only he will be you know conscious but the people they will also you know start judging that judge fine they they'll start judging his his or her individuality and character okay uh, apart from that it will hamper objectivity this is you know it can be related here because of this public consciousness okay and live streaming may also called practical problems uh, see La, uh, they may be the case that lawyers who aspire to you know publicize themselves because they know that the live streaming is being done so they'll start they'll start talking in such a tone that they will not only address the judges but the public as a whole okay so with live streaming there is a strong possibility that lawyers will tend to address not only the judges but also the public watching them this will only hamper their objectivity fine and another important aspect is that debates inside a court room especially before constitution benches of the supreme court they are you know of a different nature they require reasonable expertise to be understood it's not uh, i mean easy for everyone to understand what the constitutional un, uh, bench is basically arguing because most of the things they are in you know in terms of constitutional provisions for a common man it's really very difficult to understand because they just know the headlines okay that that right to privacy is a fundamental law in fact many of the people they don't even know what is a fundamental right okay so this is also an issue apart from that uh, during hearings judges they make or ha uh, so in this uh, constitutional bench judges they many a times make oral observations and ask questions which may not be you know a formal expression of what they are thinking many a times just to win the case or i mean just to um, instigate the accused one judges they kind of ask questions which actually are not you know in uh, sync to what they think basically what their personality is fine so whatever their arguments are they may not be in sync to their personality but they have to ask those questions okay so this is also an issue however he is suggesting that instead of these you know live streaming what can be done to bring uh, transparency in the judicial proceedings that audio and video recordings of court proceedings they would reform the administration of justice and uh, when audio and video recording is available then at the time of review or appeal of a case especially when the submission of a lawyer are not properly recorded in the judgment or if uh, uh, i mean chances are there or apprehensions are regarding the judge uh, he's he or she is acting in a whimsical manner fine 
so at that time these audio video recordings can be used and in fact in this uh, pradyuman bhisht versus union of india the uh, supreme court directed all high courts to ensure cctvs and audio video recordings in subordinate courts so uh, when supreme court said that this should be in high court obviously it could be extended to supreme courts the proceedings in supreme court and high court they can be you know recorded the audio uh, audio video recordings can be there so that it can be available when required uh, and can be available to the parties concerned and to the general public under right to information act so looking into the practical uh, practicalities the problem i mean this uh, prob problem of you know populism coming in the uh, judicial process this is a problem and apart from that objectivity is definitely going to be affected oh, and uh, objectivity is going to be affected questions on judges individuality will be raised so we, to avoid these problem and to make justice i mean an objective process what at most can be done is this okay now we have to look at the other view the third view it's saying that uh, see before we think of cameras in courts other fundamental reforms needs to be there and those who advocate this uh, you know live streaming is well in uh, intention but it may not address a root problem for which other proposals may be better suited okay and um, if we talk with respect to judges they what they think about live streaming so they have always you know they have always have a reserved view they have restrained talking on this okay and uh, the thing is that while oral hearings are open to public they are designed for specific purpose to help judges reach good decisions okay but the thing is that i mean um, he is basically given example of uh, uh, of interview of chief justice of a us court and he is saying that according to him i mean if the uh, this uh, judgments or i mean the entire process is live streamed then the judges would have internal pressure to i mean enhance their uh, judgmental uh, knowledge means judges will be in a pressure to you know uh, this uh, it's not a pressure but yes judges they have to uh, uh, give their judgments with some sort of reasoning because they know that their each and every day of uh, proceeding okay it's being live telecast so definitely it will improve the performance of the judges and if we uh, talk about this respect to canadian supreme court it's an outlier means it's an exception because none of the uh, uh, i mean uh, except this canada none of the country is uh, you know live streaming the apex court proceedings if we compare across countries then we can see that you know compared to other countries compared to canada supreme court uh, which is dispensing uh, i mean like um, 500 to which has dispensed around 500 to 600 cases in a span of 10 years um, we can see that indian judiciary it has a huge toll of pending cases and it issues a far higher number of judgments than any comparable court we are having so many pending cases in indian judiciary especially if we talk about with respect to supreme court it issues a far higher number of judgments than all these canadian and the south african courts so uh, i mean uh, and the issue in indian judiciary is that that the supreme court it rely more on the oral culture fine and emphasis is less on the written briefs and documents or a thorough preparation in advance of hearings so what he is trying to say is that that see this is an uh, definitely an apprehension that if the live streaming of the judicial proceedings is going to be take going to be there then definitely uh, it is going to affect uh, the judges performance it may be uh, good for example just as i said that the judges they will be more you know reasonable in their judgments but it may also be bad because the judges will be affected by the popular uh, wishes of the people okay so they may be more conscious 
so instead of going for such you know a drastic or radical step like live streaming what is required of fundamental reforms within the judiciary especially with respect to the proceedings in the supreme court that you know greater reliance should be on the written briefs and there should be page limit for the briefs there should be limit for oral arguments and greater emphasis should be on preparation in advance so that a well defined and a well reasonable judgment can be taken and uh, what at most i mean uh, this uh, supreme court can do that they could you know appoint a licensed officer fine which would act as a me- uh, this uh, this uh, link between the court and the media and can simultaneously issue one or two page summaries of its judgment or of the entire day proceedings to facilitate greater public understanding fine so this was about the live streaming of supreme court whether yes or no the second article is with respect to the i mean the largest scam that uh, has been there in the banking system the pnb fraud okay and <clears throat> uh, the article is saying that whatever the fraud is it must be speedily investigated to restore faith in the banking system okay and as we know that uh, punjab national bank has basically filed with the stock exchange uh, and i mean uh, told that this much amount 11500 crore fraud about this fraud okay and it is perhaps the largest scam in india and why this scam could took place is at the face we can say that it is because of you know uh, because the, this diamond merchant okay mr Mo, uh, uh, i i don't know the exact name something sir name is modi maybe we'll get in the article so diamond merchant in collusion with bank officials at a single branch in south mumbai now the thing is with respect to this article is that that the banks audit committees and boards as well as the central bank that is the rbi which conducts routine financial inspections of banks books they were even not able to you know uh, check this out okay that this much huge amount of scam is going on the government which has often blamed the pile of bad loans on crony capitalism during the upa regime just last last month unveiled a plan to infuse about 1 lakh crore into 21 capital staffed public sector banks this season now because 1 lakh crore is to be infused as a recapitalization measure into the banks and out of this 1 lakh crore rupees 5473 crore is to be injected into pnb but see the actual loss the bank ends up incurring on account of this fraud is 11500 so even after getting you know this this uh, the fraud which is being done it is double this amount okay so even after getting this amount the bank will be back to the same ad- capital adequacy ratio okay which was before the recapitalization okay so this is you know this is the hugeness of this fraud and scam and because of uh, this scam uh, the share uh, prices of the pnb have also you know it has fallen down because they are investors they are just uh, this uh, pulling their money out okay now the bank's top officials they said that they have acted promptly and uh, Uh, all these things that we have suspended uh, our ten officials and all, but it's you know really very difficult to believe that such a handful of junior employees could you know can you know create a massive fraud. It's not possible that only these junior employees they are only involved in this and can carry a huge amount of scam of this much amount. Okay. Um, banks managing director claimed that supervisory lapses are being probed. and enforcement directed directorate has initiated a money laundering case against the main accused yes this is the name nirav modi okay jai was not able to recall so money laundering cases has been filed against 
four members of the family i mean this uh, uh, nirav modi his wife and close associates and relatives but the thing is that uh, bank employees who assisted in the fraud routed large transactions for the borrowers by circumventing the core banking solutions see under the core banking solutions actually whatever the see uh, uh, bank is having a central database and whatever the transactions are being made in one or the branch then it will automatically be transferred to the other branches as well so because this kind of fraud has taken place and it was not reported in the bank that means uh, this uh, the bank employees who were basically assisting in this fraud they you know uh, uh, create such arrangement that they were able to circumvent the bank's core banking solution okay so this also uh, uh, flies in the face of government's push for digital payment economy government is pushing for digital payment economy but we are seeing that how the bank employee themselves is circumventing this core banking solutions and creating such a huge you know assisting in such a huge scam so what is the surety of the successful of digital payment economy if such kind of scams are taking place fine circumventing the so core banking solutions however bnb also blamed the overseas branches of other banks for not undertaking due diligence before accepting such transactions but that may be too simplistic an explanation because in this um, the scam which has taken place it was because a letter of understanding lou was taken from pnb and on the basis of that lou money was basically taken okay from the overseas branch i mean from the overseas banks this lou letter of undertaking basically act as a i should say security measure okay for the overseas banks that if this particular business firm who is taking loan from them is not able to pay the uh, repay the payments then the bank in this case uh, P, uh, pnb which has signed a, a, a lou it will return its money the overseas banks money but in this case of nirav modi scam the thing was that this lou was not given by the pnb it was by fraud okay it was unauthorized it was by fraud which was done by the junior banking official officers only okay so pnb is saying that fault is also of those overseas banks because while accepting that lou and giving money okay to this business firm they didn't fail to authorize it to verify it because it was such a huge amount okay so this is also the problem they are blaming blame game is going on right now an inquiry by the rbi must, so what is required is that rbi must get to the bottom of the systemic systemic lapses in this affair and fix accountability across the chain of command okay this is you know bank borrower nexus it's a very old problem and most of the time it said that it is you know blame for problems in the banking system for years and this episode has opened various chapters of nexus deeper than imagine means whatever we have thought of this nexus it is deeper than that so what is required is that rbi and investigating agencies should act speedily to restore trust in the banking system okay <clears throat> this article is with, uh, with respect to the state of education in india and it's uh, saying that we are in a deepening crisis and our national aspirations fine uh, will remain unmet as long as we fail to prioritize our education so we will look into this in short what they are trying to say is that see in 1966 there was a kothari commission okay and it said that uh, wait a minute that uh, uh, that india should aim at spending 6% of its gdp on education fine minimum 6% of gdp what are we spending this much <laughs> not at all we are spending less than 3% of our gdp on education okay now the issue is that see 
At that time, in 1966, we were newly independent nations. Barely ten decades, barely ten years have gone. Okay, ten to twelve years have gone. So at that time, you know, we were not having that much resources that we could spend six percent of our GDP on education only, because famines were there. Wars, 1965 war, we know. Fine, the 1962 war with China, and political uncertainty was also there. Fine, because Ani uh, Ani Ruji died in 1964. Then uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri he took over. Uh, fine, and then in 66 he died. So a kind of political instability was going on. Fine, uh, uh, in our country. So definitely we were not able to spend that much. The economy was stuck in sluggish growth, and the idealism of the freedom struggle was waning. Slowly, the I mean the idealism that we had. Uh, uh, uh during our freedom struggle it was waning so but the issue is that i mean uh, right now okay the conditions are very different we are in 2018 okay the conditions are very different by any standards india is comparably more prosperous today and people's aspirations regarding education are also higher fine education is valued across different sections and strata despite this favorable social climate or economic growth that we have made education has failed to become a matter of national concern and in fact you know we can see this in our budget also and this budget is no different we have not allocated that much funding to our education sector okay now what happens in the budget speech finance minister he referred to the importance of teacher education and this is indeed a welcome reference and which is rare too because rarely you know do we talk about this teachers training and the quality of basically the teaching okay and so it seldom receives high level attention and the current popular term public policy okay which is in vogue it does not cover teacher education at all we do talk about education pattern we do talk about outdated syllabus fine then need for technical education and all these things but we what we do not talk about is teachers education and training okay because if the teacher is you know is well trained and if the quality of teaching is good only then the students are get going to get what actually education is for them okay anyway so what happens that uh, apart from this uh, kothari commission uh, we had justice uh, this uh, js bhava committee fine uh, a commission was made and the report of this commission it brought to public attention the dismal dismal state of teacher education especially the corruption that has seeped into the regulatory system put in place in the mid 90s so what happens that there is an access between the regulatory authorities the commercialization of the appointing press process fine so money is being ta- uh, taken just to appoint a teacher okay especially in the government sector so this is the kind of corruption uh, in the even in the education sector okay so the justice homo commission offered several good remedies to improve the regulatory structure and for a little while it seemed as if things were moving forward but the progress could not be sustained so after the justice uh, this uh, verma commission reports uh, focus was i mean little bit focus was there on the regulatory structure regarding these teachers appointments and training and all but we could not you know sustain that moment that movement okay now in this budget the finance ministry he made a special mention of the four year integrated bed program fine for achieving quality in teacher training but the question is who is going to fund this program okay whether the central government will spend the money the sector needs so far the indications have been that teacher education will have to pay for its own growth okay i mean uh, what the government is willing to invest in is mainly the in service part of the sector those teachers who are right now in service for their training government will pay but those who are basically are about to do beard and all these th- or beard pre service courses like beard they continue to have a huge market outside public institutions fine so they have to spend by themselves okay what else is there yeah 
Now the question is whether the government is aware of its responsibility towards higher education. Teachers for all levels are directly or indirectly affected by institutions of higher education. In fact, uh, this paragraph is really very good because it is uh, establishing the importance of higher education, not only just for the sake of employment, okay? In fact, higher education is important for the quality of primary education and secondary education as well. We will see how this is linked. Okay, see, if higher education is good, quality of higher education is there, then suppose there is a person who is qualified from psychology, fine, who has done graduation from psychology, post-graduation from psychology, and if that person is appointed as a teacher in primary school, just for the example, then he or she will be knowing that what a child psychology is. How can a child be able to learn the things? And what should be the pattern of my teaching? Or if that teacher, I mean, if that person is not a teacher, let's say he is in the, I mean, this uh, administration of the school, fine. So he will be knowing uh, that what sort of teaching should be imparted. He can monitor the teachers, fine. So this is the importance of higher education in primary education. Even in secondary education, fine. See, we say mostly in secondary education in 10th and 12th that there is no science labs. There is no adequate fa faculty. Now, the graduates, fine, who opt for school teaching as a career can hardly do just to the students who choose to study science. If at the graduation level, means at the higher education level, they are not having enough practical knowledge then what will they teach if one day they will become a teacher in the secondary education to the students who basically opt for science what students can you know uh, look up to them so this in this way higher education is affecting secondary education so we can see that how the different levels of education they are interrelated and mainly dependent on the higher education we are giving okay so these are reasons that why the degraded state of under education limits the potential impact of training on a school teacher's academic capacity. Uh, yes, there was a <coughs> Yashpal committee, a Yashpal report on renovation and rejuvenation of higher education. And it presented a very bleak picture of undergraduate education and offered certain recommendations as well. And one of the recommendation was increased public spending. Fine. But the issue is that we are not having any sort of roadmap for that. Fine. And it's a legitimate question. Why India does not worry about its educational crisis? Or why does it not invest more on public funds in education? Okay. So uh, he is uh, saying that on the part of the government, any suggestion is welcomed, provided it provides arguing for more funds from the public ex exchequer. Fine. And the damage our, uh, our institutional apparatus has suffered over the last three decades has begun to hurt our long-term national economic interest and social goals. See, because of this, because of poor pattern of education we have, not only our national economic interests are affected, why national economic interest? Because if there is lack of education, if there is lack of quality education, then there will be lack of skills, there will be lack of employment. Be, uh, I mean, those who are graduates, even if they are graduates, they'll not be able to get uh, employment for themselves, fine. So it will hurt our economic interest, our economic growth, okay. Then how it will hurt our social goals? Because the people who are not having quality education, not having employment, then they will be more vulnerable to the kind of social unrest, to the kind of, you know, uh, this um, incidence of riots and all these things in the uh, this society. Fine. So in this way, social unrest can also be there. So we have to focus more on our education. We need to recognize that growing inequality and dissonance among youth are a consequence of malnourished institutional ex uh, experience. So our priority should be uh, on the education 
and national aspirations might get us jolt if we fail to prioritize our education okay